um, other than the axiom of choice, the other non-constructive piece tool that mainstream mathematicians use today is this law of the excluded middle. And this says that for any statement P, either P or not P must be true. And this is the foundation of what's called proof by contradiction. So we assume that something is false. If you can derive a contradiction, well then not P can't be true, so P must be true. Not not P is the same as P. Several different ways of stating the same thing. It turns out this is implied by the axiom of choice. And this is called, we call this Diakonescu's theorem for some reason. Uh, <laughs> this guy published this in 1975, but the problem appeared as an exercise in a textbook in 1967. So already in the 60s, it was considered simple enough to be an undergraduate, or probably not an undergraduate, but at least a student's exercise. So somehow someone published this eight years later. Go figure. In any case, um, I don't know, is there still interest? I can present a short proof of uh, yeah, how the axiom of choice, would you like to see it? Yep. How the axiom of choice implies the principle of the excluded middle. Okay, so I want to show that for any statement P, uh, I mean, I don't mean any statement, it has to be written in first order logic or something, but these technicalities are not important for us. Either P or not P is true. So I'm going to define two sets, U and V. So U is the collection of all X's in 0, 1, just these two elements, two numbers, such that either P is true or X is equal to 0. And that V is exactly the same, except that it's saying P is true or X is equal to 1. So if I already know that P is true, then U is just 0 and 1, right? And V is also 0 and 1. But if I don't know that, I want to establish this, right? So I'm not going to assume this. So on the face of it, I'm, to I'm totally allowed to construct sets in this way. And then I take a choice function. I take a choice function on the set U, V. So I'm taking my function defined on this two element set U and V. Uh, the value of our function F at U is inside of U. It's going to be either 0 or 1. And the value of V is inside of V, so it's also going to be 0 or 1. And by the definition of these sets, I know that either P is true or F of U must be 0. Because if P is false, then X has to be 0. So either P or F of U is equal to 0. And the same thing happens on the right side. Uh, this, this wedge is my AND, my logical AND. So it's saying either P is true, or the value of my function F at the element V has to be 1, because of how V is defined. To be inside of V, this is really what this means. Either P is true, or V must be 1. So I'm just going to rewrite this line. Is everybody with me so far? So I'll just rewrite this as either P or f of u is not equal to f of v, because f of u is 0 and f of v is 1, right? So far, so good? OK. Then, let's, p, if p is true, then u is equal to v, because u and v are both just 0 1. And if u is equal to v, then f of u has to be equal to f of v, because they're the same thing. So f of u being not the same as f of v implies the negation of p. So then I can just go from p or f is not the same as v to p or not p. I'm done. Uh -huh. I, does, uh, does this go backwards? Does the law of the excluded middle uh, somehow imply that? It doesn't. It doesn't, though. It doesn't. It definitely, it definitely doesn't. <laughs> okay, good. But this was really amazing to me. When Aaron pointed this out, I didn't believe it until I found a proof on Wikipedia. This is exactly the proof of Wikipedia rewritten a little bit to be nicer and more accessible. I think this is really amazing. So um, really, the axiom of choice is the king of all non-constructive methods. So it totally subsumes the only other non-constructive technique. Choice gives you excluded middle. Choice gives you excluded middle. You cannot live in a world in which the axiom of choice is true, and you disallow proof by contradiction. Right. But we don't. But you could take excluded middle as an axiom without taking choice. Which is yeah. yeah. This is what most people do. In fact, the axiom of choice, the excluded middle, is almost not so much an axiom. It's like it's an axiom of our logical meta theory. It's not even an axiom of the set theory. It's something that we just take to be true as a point of logic. It's what Cantor might have called a valid law of thought that doesn't even require axiomization. Yeah. But it's interesting that you don't need to do that. You get it for free, at least for sets. Yes. Something very suspicious here because you use the uh, use choice on a finite collection. Yeah. Um, I, uh, I, I agree with that. Why am I doing this? I mean, I'm allowed to. <laughs> yeah. um, well, See, the issue is normally my x I is finite, but your p is not, right? The piece. Piece fixed, piece fixed. So normally you would never need to use choice in this situation because you would construct, you would just construct a particular choice function. Right? But in this case, we don't, well, 
Well, maybe you could show that uh, you could construct all the choice functions and maybe they're each equivalent to either a case where P is true or P is false. Well, the issue here is we don't really know what U and B are. We have kind of an incomplete description of U and B. We, don't, we only know what they are up to whether or not P is true. So, yeah, it's so true. P this could a be a strange. statement that depends on some sort of infinite precondition or Yeah, sure, maybe. We just have no idea, like a priori. But in the beginning, we have no idea whether P should be true or false. So we don't want to attempt to construct an explicit choice function because we don't know how to do that not knowing what P is. So like, this is the issue. So I think uh, I have never seen another example where you need to invoke the excellent choice on a finite collection of things which are themselves finite. It's a lot more subtle than it looks. It's, it's, it's even hard to imagine not allowing yourself to use these tools. They're so how, does, how does that problem oh, uh, what was the which problem? The, the fact that you can't show that they are finite. I mean, that's that's sort of the core of why this group is interesting, right? Is that you need choice yeah, because um, you need to show that they're finite, basically. I mean, that's not what we're using it for, but that's we're sort of. Well, I think out. the issue is to establish that they're finite, you'd have to prove that they have either constructively either one or two elements, and there's no hope of doing this. Constructively, there's no way of proving that either U and B have are finite. You'd have to show that they're constructively finite, you'd have to show that they have either one element or two elements, and there's no hope of doing this without like establishing P or not. Yeah, because if you did it constructively, either P would be true, or it would, or it would be yeah. unknown, or it would yeah, be you false. You can't do anything if you don't know about P. Oh, right, because P could be... Who knows? You don't know anything about P. Yeah, could be right. fluffy bunnies. Yeah. Sure. And so now it's not actually one or two, it's, it's, it would be three. It's, it's true, false, and fluffy bunnies. Yeah, well, yeah. I mean, it, it better not be three, because it's a subset of zero, one, right? Well, if... if P is not a well stated predicate. Like, if it doesn't make sense in your theory, then the set would what not exist or be empty or well, not be I mean, valid. Like if, you, like, if you can't formulate P properly, then you can't construct this set in the first place. Yeah. You're using an axiom called like the axiom of extensionality or something to uh, to establish that such a set should even exist. Because you know that you have to restrict what P's are allowed to define sets by, right? You can't use set of all sets that don't contain themselves. Yes. Yeah. So you you first of all restricted the P's that are allowed. I'm assuming that P is a well-formed. But in a constructive theory of mathematics, you, you might have more knowledge about what the well-formedness of P, and this might negate your need to have a yeah. to choice function or something. Okay. Oh, it's gone. But that's the end of the talk anyway, so I'll just leave it. <laughs>